So I'm going to tell a little bit about myself because here I am in a Japanese theater, I was going to do a sumo move. But how many of you work with distributed teams? People in Asia, people around Europe, people you've never met face to face. Nearly all of us. That's just how it is in IT these days. And would you keep your hand up if you also consider yourself an introvert or you've taken a Myers-Briggs test and know you're an introvert at some level? Which is a little more than half, which is pretty typical for tech com people, right? We're, we like our space, we like things, you know, just to be under our control. And believe it or not, I, most of my life was an introvert and now just barely have crossed that midpoint of being an extrovert. Uh, and there's some risk there because I like to be comfortable, I like being in my space. But that's cost me at various times in my career, because when I'm withdrawn and not reaching out to people, maybe I'm getting the job done, but nobody knows it, and they see me as aloof and disengaged and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to get into you know, how you can make an effort to do a little bit more and break through that. I'm not going to talk about tools, because there's a ton of great collaboration tools out there, and they're going to keep changing, they're going to keep improving. But the only thing that's going to stay consistent is the skills you develop as a communicator, not just writing your docs, but reaching out to SMEs and getting what you need from them. Uh, the other thing, I'm just going to touch on a bunch of stuff very superficially. You can take week-long stuff about communications, communication types, reading body language, graphology, all sorts of things. I'm going to very brutally graze on these things and actually not deep dive into any of them. Um, <laughs> But I, I had to use this image. Why does remote collaboration suck? Um, one, we've never met the people we're working with, right? I most, unless you're lucky and your company has money and flies you out to places, you, you've never met them. Maybe they're good people, they do the stuff you want, but I don't know, what are they like eating for lunch? What, what was their favorite movie last year? You know, the, the level of trust is different. You trust them professionally, but at a deeper level, you know, it's not the same as when it's someone you've walked down the hall and met. Because um, 20 odd years ago, when I started in tech work, you know, that's how it was. 30 person company, you needed something, just walk over, you meet them at the coffee machine. It was easy, you could build rapport. Um, when people are in seven continents and a bunch of time zones, it's, it's a lot more challenging. And all we have in common is project work. And maybe they do a fine job, but it takes a lot longer to build rapport with someone who all they do is you know, meet a deliverable on a burn down chart. Uh, people we hate working with are, you know, and I've been guilty of this, I'm not a superstar or anything, you know, you don't finish stuff on time, or you just are always in kind of a grumpy mood, going, ah, Jesus, yeah, I, this stuff, yeah, sure, I'll do it, whatever. You know, that's a really common in IT. Uh, so those are the people we hate working with. I actually am not a nihilist, believe it or not, although I thought about it. Uh, but these days, I like people, that's why I'm at SOAP, because... Uh, it's always been a great experience here. So as an introvert, what can we do, right? There are strengths we have. Um, one thing, as someone who likes to work alone and have their space, you can do stuff other people can't. You can volunteer to do those individual tasks, right, that require solitude. Because um, maybe the extroverted people want to do that stuff where they're running around between teams. So that's one thing you can leverage. Um, the other thing is if you think before you speak, and have a tendency to sit back and let other people talk, you can be that person that chimes in at the end and gives a perspective that the extroverted people who are more aggressive about diving in and setting the scene, you know, you can, if you do it right, you can chime in and kind of give a perspective that other people have missed while trying to get their opinions heard. On the other hand, that's also, you know, one of the drawbacks, right? We do tend to sit back, we do tend to uh, avoid attention, and definitely, as some of us were talking during a break, you know, Big groups scare the hell out of us. Uh, and having a nice small group is cool. Two or three people you actually know, that's good. But when it's 12 people in a room, or it's a, a maze of faces on a WebEx call, or Zoom, or whatever tool you're using, that, that's more intimidating. Um, so why does it matter, right? You know, you know, building rapport, empathy with your colleagues, how does that really help? Well, the bottom line is, if you cannot show empathy to the SMEs that you need information from to write a good doc or do whatever you need to do, how are you going to have empathy for your users and deliver something they actually want, right? The two go hand in hand, in my opinion. And the same for monitoring forums and user feedback. You, you know, empathy is just part of the deal. I don't think it's a big issue for most people in this room, but I just wanted to make the point and move on. Um, this I just want to bash on because it's this 
oft-quoted thing about 93% of communication is, you know, how you say it in your body language, not the words. And even the guy who did the study, Merhabian, said, it's, a, it's baloney. It was about one word, and if you felt good or bad, happy or sad. It wasn't meant to be this all-encompassing thing about how humans communicate. Um, but how you say stuff does matter. And as we all know, it's like it wasn't what they said, it was how they said it. How we listen also makes a difference. Um, if you've got only like one hour a week to collaborate with this colleague, and you're answering email, and tapping away at your phone, and updating JIRA issues, you're not going to be listening the same way. You'll understand the words probably because you know, you're multitasking, but maybe you'll miss <clears throat> part of the nuance of what they were saying. You know? And so to give that empathy, it's just a little more effort, just a little more energy. You can listen differently. And you know, the way you sit even, if you're paying attention, if you're actually engaged in the call, that can make a difference. I get the feeling I'm going slightly faster than anticipated. Um, this is an old chart. Um, this is a kind of a cheeky way you can get empathy from people, or excuse me, read people without ever having met them if you're lucky enough to have some kind of video conferencing. You can tell if someone's got visual, uh, auditory, or kinetic responses, you know, what their primary means of hearing something and going, yeah, that sounds right to me, or it didn't connect with me. It was, you know, if, if you use uh, visual idioms and the person's actually kinetic, you know, you would need to switch up how you're talking. So if you can see someone's eye movement after you ask a question, and where are they, you know, are they trying to remember something, or are they trying to imagine how that would feel, you know, depending if they're looking down or off to the side, it's true for 90% of the people across cultures worldwide, with the exception of Basque people, and for left-handed people, it's the exact opposite of this. But it's, it's pretty cool, and nobody knows why Uscara people are different, they just are. Thank goodness for that. We need people like that in the world. Um, so th what I was just saying is this, you know, so if you realize somebody is auditory or visual, you can use these same idioms in communicating with them. You say, yeah, I see your point, or yeah, that sounds good to me, or hey, that bug fix, you know, really, you know, knocked it out, you know. Go with that, keep those communications congruent. It's maybe not too subtle, but it actually can be effective. It's just another few percentage points for moving the needle, um, so to speak. Uh, so isn't that just phony, right? Can rapport really be engineered, and do we, is it really insincere and cynical to kind of do that? Well, again, we're talking about just not just getting our jobs done better, but also everybody feeling better, everybody having a better experience as a result, because they feel like, hey, I kind of connected with that person, it seemed like they really wa wanted me to help them, so I did, as opposed to the usual just close a bug, finish an issue. Um, matching and mirroring. Pardon me, I just want to get in that sec. The second part about matching and mirroring, does anyone know what it is from NLP? Okay, handful of you. It's a common tactic, but you definitely only want to use it in a one-on-one -on -one communication scenario. If you go into a room with eight people and you try and match and mirror everybody there, you're going to be a schizophrenic. They're going to throw you out of there and call the police. The loony bin is ready for this guy. Um, but if you have an SME, you're going to have a scheduled call with or somebody you're actually going to meet, even if all you have is your voice, you can do things that will build rapport with them. If they talk softly, and slowly, in a considered way, match that tone. If the person's full of energy and really stressed, match the tone. You don't have to match their exact words, but if you match their energy level and the speed at which they talk, it unconsciously builds rapport with them. Another thing you can do is echo their language. Like, if you have an SME who uses the term issue instead of bug, or defect instead of issue, match their language, use their terminology. And it's just a subtle way of showing that you agree with them, you're on their side, and please won't you help me and give this information because our deadline's next week. But these things actually really work. And even if all you have is their voice and you can't see their eyes, like on the previous chart, if all you have is their voice, you can hear at the bottom, does it work? Uh, anyway, laser pointer, there we go. This, listening for cues. Sometimes people do use idioms that indicate that they're auditory or visual or very kinetic, that, you know, and once you pick up on that, it gives you a way to really reach them 
at a different level. And it's, it's a subtle difference, but we're talking about the quality of user experience. Everything is incremental when it comes to that. Um, this is just from years of radio and recording podcasts and vocals for rock bands or whatever. Audio quality matters a lot. I have a couple colleagues who love speakerphone because they get to be hands-free and type, and the auto audio quality on a typical normal phone is horrific. I don't mean holding it up to their head. I mean when they hit speakerphone on a normal desk phone. It sounds, it's that bottom of the well sound, and you don't want that, right? You, you want the quality to be good. So a little quality control, ask a friend, set up a meeting with them, and just record it. A minute is all it takes. And just, what does it sound like um, when it goes through WebEx or it goes through Zoom? What does my voice sound like? Is it good enough? Should I change headsets? Should I use my laptop mic? Because if people hear static or echo or whatever, they just like, mute this guy, just dump him. Um, and the same is on YouTube. If the stats on YouTube for abandonment, it has more to do with audio quality than the visuals. If, it, especially if it's something that's just communication. Uh, people want good audio quality much more than they want a video. You know, if you're watching an old bootleg of a concert, you want that audio to be good. You know, the grainy video kind of adds to the reality of, wow, that was the 80s and people had VHS, that's rocks. <laughs> so that's what I remember. Um, and also uh, speaking, one thing that often happens in recording, you know, if you just sit there and record, you don't have the same energy. So gesturing matters. You know, when I have to record voiceovers for videos, I do the thing. It's like one of the things we want to do, and you smile. And it, it's a bit of a performance, sure, but it makes such a difference in your voice. And if you're trying to make a connection with someone who has never met you, just you're that voice once a week on the call and that two seconds you give a roundtable update, that can make a difference. So it doesn't take a lot, but that kind of enthusiasm will make you at least go, oh, okay, I know who that is. Um, and if you do use webcam, uh, it is nice. And if you have the possibility to use it, definitely use it. Connecting a voice to a face is a big deal. And the most important thing is if you can see someone's facial gestures or they can see yours, you can agree without saying a word, right? If everyone's on the call and you're talking about an issue and you see some nods, you suddenly know that six people agreed with you that this was a nonsense issue that we've wasted 10 minutes on or that this is really great, we're all really happy, this change is coming. So it, that can be big. You don't even have to say a word. You can stay comfortable and quiet and <laughs> do that, um, or, or as I would like to do. But again, it's, it's a risk for me. I, um, I don't want to deep dive too much into culture because I'm by no means an expert on it. E even within cultures I'm allegedly an expert of, like California or Prague, I don't know anything. But there is differences um, in competitiveness within an office. Um, you know, you can often project your own cultural values or your office's cultural values onto the other location. And it's not always true. People can be intensely competitive in, you know, parts of Asia because the competition for jobs is fierce and everybody wants that, and people don't always help each other. Um, maybe it sounds like it on the call from over here, but it can be very different over there. How are decisions made, you know? All that top-down stuff versus bottom-up, spontaneous versus structured communications can be an issue. It really depends on the dynamic of your team. Um, so in the end, what can you do? You can't change, you can't be a new person every time you're on a call. So ultimately, you know, nothing new, you gotta be yourself. If you're not sure that people understood you, or you're not sure you understand them, ask. And ask offline if it feels more discreet to send them a personal IM, do that. And uh, understanding your SMEs. Um, if they're located somewhere else, even if it's a country you know, oh, they're in France, whatever, put the French holidays on your calendar so you know, ah, it's another one of those four-day weekends in France, or, um, oh yeah, that's right, it's a, you know, the new Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year at this country, they're gonna be off for a week. Add the holidays of your remote colleagues onto your calendar. It makes a difference, and at least read a wiki page. Spend, invest five minutes into knowing how they became a country, when their elections are. Uh, just a little bit of cultural awareness goes a very long way. Um, especially if people aren't used to people reaching out about it. It, it can make a difference. Um, one thing Google dis discovered, because they're worldwide, they have like, I don't know how many offices, but they're probably in at least 50 places. The two things they find, found out is uh, it doesn't matter how you do it, but if people get to share the same amount of time, uh, it helps the teams. They feel like they're all equals. They're, they're kind of on the same place. 
And the psychological safety, just that feeling that everybody can be themselves. You know, they don't have to put on an act and, oh, I got my mask on. They can mention that, whew, yeah, I went to a show last night, I'm pretty, you know, burnt out today. And nobody's going to jump on them and say, ah, you're not serious. You don't take your career, you know, all that seriously. What's your mom going to say? And, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, but th they really did come down to this, and they spent millions on this. And it's not the only thing. There were so many other variables that they looked at that didn't make a difference. Um, this is pretty obvious, but just structure helps, especially for people who aren't comfortable sharing and just jumping in and giving their opinion. If you send out an agenda to your meetings, if you're a call leader, do that in advance. And as well, also solicit feedback from them. Say, hey, does anyone have another topic? Is there some other issue that's blocking you or that you need resolved? You know, and do that the day before. Um, use people's names and mention your own name. Uh, that's pretty obvious, but a lot of times you assume everyone on the call knows you. Maybe somebody's new on the call. They have no idea who you are. They don't have any association to that voice. So you say, hey, yeah, this is Brad, and I noticed that this week uh, this issue keeps popping up. We have a recurrence of you know, JIRA, blah, 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 blah. And at the same time, um, ask people on the call to do the same, you know, so that everybody kind of, at least there's a name with that disembodied voice. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so obsessed with the water and taking a sip, but... Uh, this is something new I encountered. Uh, I didn't realize it existed, uh, but virtual team building is now a thing. Um, there's a couple of games about this because, and it's not POV shooter games. It's not you know guys running around doing this, but it rather it's the first or rather the second one I have there, Scavenger Hunt, is designed exactly for new teams put together in remote locales so that people share little bits of trivia about themselves, where they grew up, what their favorite band is, what food they like, etc. And it's totally about getting to know each other. The second one is actually about collaborative resolution. And people have to help each other in order to solve a problem. And it, they do it on company time. You take two hours, you play a game, you get stuff done. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I got to stop looking back at the slide. I don't do this enough. Uh, so what difference does it make? Seriously. <laughs> but the real productivity gap, I, I just love that quote because the difference between, you know, Good and bad is, is huge, but you can do something or do nothing. And if you do nothing, then you get the same result. But if you do something, two things are going to happen. One is, people will notice you're making an effort to reach out to them and try and build some rapport. Even if it's a clumsy effort and it's not perfect, they're still going to notice. They're still human beings. And the second thing is, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. You'll get better at building rapport and reading people's cues and going on. Um, the platinum rule as opposed to the golden rule, um, treat others as they want to be treated. You know, we all think everyone wants to be treated like me, but I know well enough that's not true. <laughs> Nobody wants to be treated like me. So I have to imagine and ask, solicit real feedback. What do you, how do you want to interact on this? What's your preferred method of communication? Do you like IMs, email? Do you like direct calls? You know, find out what their preferred methods are. And uh, personalize yourself. You know, make that little effort to become a human to that person, to understand a bit about them. Okay, they miss work because their kid got sick. You know, show a little bit of that humanity when you're working with folks. And I don't know, I hope some of it can help you because really I think it's just that little difference between we got the project done, right, and got the project done, it was kind of nice, we worked together well, I'm looking forward to the next project. That's, that's all it is, improving the user experience of our remote collaboration worldwide. That's all, folks. Thank you, Brad. You got me. I, um, I really thought, probably because I work remotely myself, mm. that it's about you know, working remotely like from your perspective, not with teams scattered around the world. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of similar, but uh, yeah, you got me there. Multinationals. Okay, Sorry? Multinational companies, it's yeah, the reality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, questions? Yeah, we have a few. Hi, thank you very much for that. And uh, It's not um, maybe a question, but I would like to share my story. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I um, joined my uh, company, uh, I started uh, joining uh, working groups. And uh, one was very interesting because before people started the meeting, before everyone, everybody called in, uh, there was small talk. Mm -hmm. 
and it was the only one. There were jokes, not not only uh, not always uh, correct one, <laughs> yeah, mm. like politically correct or something, but <laughs> but there were jokes, and I uh, I enjoy uh, this group mm -hmm. mostly because uh, I can relate to those people, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something I I started doing myself, like when I start a meeting and I'm waiting for people, I start small talk. I never allow silence, it's like radio. In radio, there can't be silence. And <laughs> it's awful thing when you have people in the room, I guess, and uh, there are other people uh, uh, remotely, and, and we, we mute and we talk to each other, yeah? yeah? And then, okay, we unmute, and uh, yeah, so that's my story. That's a great example. And there's so many things I wanted to put on and so many slides I removed thinking, Psh, yeah, this is a good example, but that's a great one. If you have an informal channel to just hang out with people, um, use it because those relationships are what gonna carry you, you know, forward, you know, in a lot of different situations. It, it makes it so much better. So next question, if there's any. Yeah, we have like a few more. Uh, one comment and one question uh, about audio conferencing. The, that's what I heard, that over 50% of people that do audio conferencing without a video plan to do something else at the same time. Mm -hmm. So beware when you do your video. So then you can hear. So could you repeat the last question, please? <laughs> that, that's, what <laughs> that's what happens on the audio calls because people multitask. So I would... That, that would be my two cents on the, uh, on the conference calls without the video. So pe sure. half of the people do something else at the same time. My question uh, to you would be, so all of this is also about emotions. Mm -hmm. like, and, and actually, we, we're not good at it as humans. And Marshall Rosenberg said that we are more... Uh, creative in saying bad things about other people that <laughs> describing how we feel. <laughs> yep. So that's bad. So so my question to you would be like, how do you see the solution? Because if we don't, if I can't describe how I feel or how I am, how can I be compassionate to you? <laughs> and and then we don't have emotion classes at school. Uh, we. There Nor no, should we. <laughs> it's like this. This topic is is nowhere there in our education or at work. Nobody talks about it. We seem to have nearly no solution. And then there are a couple of techniques that could just touch this topic. But then the question is, how do we solve the the systemic problem? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if this answers your question, but I'll share a quick story because it's not all about positive emotions. That's great if you can consciously guide yourself to be have positive interactions with people. But the truth is, people bond over misery more than they do over good times. The people I'm still friends with from a job 20 years ago, we had an IRC channel called Pound Vent, hashtag vent, and all we did was complain about idiotic users who couldn't use a modem, and just, we ripped people, and we stayed friends for, for decades. We went to weddings together. <laughs> um, the same thing at another company in Prague. It's like the, the people you went out and vented with, we bonded over the same, okay, we all hate this. And that's why I put misanthropy into my thing, because that's, you know, and we don't actually hate all humanity, but I just can't stand it when they do that stuff. What are they thinking? So what you said is absolutely correct. Often we bond more on negativity because we get so much more energized and creative about that than, you know, like, oh, you're doing great. That's really nice. I mean, that's necessary. And it takes a conscious effort to do the positive stuff. But it's totally true. The negative stuff is where it's really easy to just find commonality. Um, totally agree, if that answers it a little. Yeah, for, for me, for example, we don't even deal with anger. Anger is, for me, is a positive emotion because it means that someone touched something really important in you. Yeah, I had then, 20 minutes, so... <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, then sometimes it's really important for other people to know, hey, this got me angry. Mm. Because they have to face it. Uh, Th that's a valid point. I, I maybe should have included something about how to channel negativity in a constructive way. That, that would have been a good thing to include. I agree. Okay, still more questions, right? We have time for them. Yeah. So 
I am not an introverted person, vice versa, actually. Uh, I tend to talk to people a lot, even to people I remotely collaborate with. And uh, I tend to, uh, I often have to collaborate with the northern nations that are really, really introverted people. Mm. And uh, they often tend to get annoyed by extroverts. What are, what is your advice to extroverts? How not to be annoying? for you, uh, <laughs> for the rest of the world. <laughs> wow, that, that's a pretty hardwired trait. Um, I, th I think communicating discreetly and respecting their boundaries, and they don't like to be called out in a public way. So if, and again, asking them specifically, what's your preferred me means of communication? Maybe it's going to be IM, maybe it's an email where they have total control. Because introverts, email was our long suit, right? Email rocked when it was when that was a primary corporate communication medium because you could sit and consider your words. But now that people are using Slack and so many different instant communications, it's easier to sit back on your heels. So best advice is just be, um, you know, listen to what they want and try to communicate with them individually because but if possible. Even though, uh, even if you, you do it, you try to build like personal connections uh, and try to know more about the person and really the introverted person not always feel okay with this. It, it's true and there's extensive courses on how to do that and <laughs> no, really, it's, I'm not an expert in that area so I'm, I really don't want to give any advice but all I can say is like it takes time and it uh, takes uh, some attention and uh, yeah. Keep, keep at it. It's possible. <laughs> keep <Thank> listening. <laughs> we can talk offline about it. Anyone else? Yeah, we have two more. Uh, one very short story on conf calls and one question on conf calls now. So, Long time ago, I was uh, supposed to run conf calls for about 20 people. I better not tell who they were. I was definitely not their leader. I was just a techie supposed to uh, tell what the next topic will be, invite the presenters and so on. And the major issue for many, many of those uh, conf calls was that one person was breathing very heavily. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, like uh, Lord Vader. And we could recognize the voice, but uh, we could do nothing to silence him for some reasons. Mm -hmm. And the most uh, decent explanation was that he was smoking and didn't mute his phone. There are many other stories, um, theories, what's happening there. But you know, the f uh, interesting part, part about this is that, uh, well, the, the speakers got, got really angry about it, but uh, somehow the audience was very alert and nobody was uh, sleeping during the, those calls because people were curious what will happen next, who will start shouting at him, and what else um, background noise we will hear next, so there were some giggles and, and whatnot. So sometimes really bad things can, can somehow wake people up. But the serious question now, imagine we have a conf call with no video option, a small group of people up to five uh, to resolve one topic. Just one topic, not set of presentations like that one with, with the smoker, but just one topic. Uh, what time, what duration of the call would you recommend so that it... For one topic? Yeah. Depends on the complexity of the topic. I mean, really, it could be a two-minute call. It could be an hour and a half. It depends on what kind of rapport and consensus already agrees between the people. I mean, I don't know. In 25 years, I've seen awful things where people who are the alleged experts when the, within the company cannot agree on the most fundamental thing. It takes them 45 minutes of arguing, and yet other places, everyone's like, yep, good, done, next. Uh, uh, my question is uh, more like, after what time uh, do you think people lose focus? Lose f focus. I, again, think that's highly dependent on their level of engagement and how much they're involved. But I think one thing you do want to do is make, is make sure everyone's involved, and that gets into calling people out by name giving people equal time and making sure that everybody gets included in whatever the conversation is, make sure that structurally everybody gets a chance to share what they have. Because um, a lot of people won't volunteer it until they're specifically asked in a nice, gentle way. So. Yeah, one last question there. Yeah, I think it will be the last one. Hi, Brad. 
thanks for the great talk. Uh, so one quick question. Uh, how do, You talked about uh, that people bond over negative experiences. And uh, I do agree. I have, you know, it, it happened to me too. But uh, it can also backfire very easily. And the overall atmosphere in the team can become overly negative. So like, how do you prevent that from happening, I suppose? Mm. And maybe also a second question. It's like mm, people. Oh, hey, okay, let's stick to this one. <laughs> you got some tough questions. So, so the question was, how do you prevent it from going too negative? Uh, that's again, that's it's incredibly subject, subjective, and I would say that's something I've struggled with because it's really easy to get totally bitter and cynical about a place if you say, well, this company doesn't know how to do anything right, everything always just blows up like this. So at the end of the day, you've got to keep your eye on whatever the goal is, whatever the deliverable is, kind of keep things moving forward in the right direction, even if there's barriers there. Because at some point, and you have to, somebody has to chime in and be positive and say, okay, all that's true, but that doesn't change the fact that we need to get this done. So let's go ahead and move forward off of that and try and get it done. It's good to give people time to vent, definitely. You don't want to like prohibit negative talk. That, that just ruins team chemistry. But you do have to kind of block, cut it off at some point and say, sorry, speaking of cut off. Uh, <laughs> and you do need to cut it off at some point and say, okay, acknowledge that. Maybe we can talk about that offline if this is really you know, messing up your life. But let's go ahead and move forward and try to get to the solution we're looking for or what, you know, go on with the rest of the agenda. Yeah, th there's a balance. Pretty dull answer. <laughs> I was just checking if we can go with another question, but uh, I think we should finish now. Sorry. You can still continue uh, during the coffee break or maybe after. Uh, Brad is still here. Brad, thank you a lot. Thank you.